I'd be surprised if you don't know someone with a Netflix account. Maybe more peeps with Amazon Prime, Hulu, HBO Go, Sky Go, and like 50 other services. All online television. What started with Netflix sending films and box sets by mail has become a behemoth in mainstream television. And it's no wonder, with quality shows like Handmaid's Tale, Stranger Things, the ever-expanding Marvel TV universe, as well as shows that started on mainstream cable TV but moved beyond, Game of Thrones is now watched predominantly on demand. That is, when it does come back, hopefully before we're all too old to remember what happened last season. Right now, streaming is king. It's easy to look at it with Netflix and Amazon Prime at the helm and think, how great that I can watch so many shows on one platform. You're right in thinking it's good. You're even right in thinking that's how it started, as one big push to aggregate, to unite different franchises and intellectual properties under one corporate neutral umbrella. Indeed, it would be convenient and comfortable to believe that. But that's not what's happening. Far from it, the past is also the future. We're going back to how it was before. Let's take a trip down memory lane, shall we? In 2010, before Netflix had any sort of push and pull in the industry, you may have noticed how so many US, Canadian shows and other countries' shows as well had seasons stretching upwards of 20 episodes. While UK shows in the same category, I remember Doctor Who and Sherlock had only a handful of well-crafted episodes. Two things made it that way. The money men in television wanted to cover the entirety of the TV season from September till May and to get money off of advertisers, and shows could only be syndicated after 100 episodes. Syndication means quote-unquote renting out the show to other channels, and it was how shows in the US actually made any money back in the olden days. Uh, as far as I understand it, syndication is a pretty much US practice only. The quicker you got to 100 episodes, the better. This was the main reason, and still is in some shows, why shows often have and had so much filler. Cable was a strong contender, however. With Breaking Bad on AMC and Game of Thrones on HBO, they proposed a 13 or even 10 episode structure. Unheard of. In Game of Thrones, some episodes reached well over their average 55 minutes into proper feature length, and the last episode of season 7 had over 1 hour and 20 minutes. That's almost as long as Mean Girls at 90 minutes. That's not to say Game of Thrones went for the same style as Mean Girls, but if you ask me, gritty medieval realism is exactly what Mean Girls needed. This had allowed for a lot of change. Very positive change in TV show quality. If 10, 15 years ago TV shows were where the rejection bin was for unwanted movie stars, nowadays it might be even the other way around. The change happened with higher budgets, tighter narratives and fewer episodes. This allowed the writers to outgun one another in TV series quality year after year since 2010 or so. Game of Thrones busted in with these crazy numbers. 100 million US dollars for one season? That's crazy. Netflix tried competing with Marco Polo in big budgets, but the show never quite took off. But with these changes and a couple of tectonic shifts in the industry, mainly Disney's rise to complete domination of our entertainment, with their purchase of both Marvel and Star Wars, a series of mergers, not least the current one between AT&T and Time Warner happening right now, the freedom, if you want to call it that, from the lofty beginnings of the streaming industry might be coming to an end. Why lease your stuff to others when you can keep it under the same corporate umbrella is exactly what the thinking goes right now. This isn't some distant future, no, no. Disney has been pulling its titles, animation, superhero-based titles, and much more from both Netflix and Amazon. There is a consolidation coming. There is a reckoning coming. And the consolidation seems to look like this. Disney, do remember, they have animation, Star Wars, Marvel, Pirates of the Caribbean, and much more. Amazon Prime Video, Netflix, maybe Hulu. They're still tiny right now, though. And then there's the old guard. The TV broadcasters turned 21st century streamers. I'm talking about the merger between AT&T and Time Warner, which will bring HBO, Warner Brothers, Cartoon Network, as well as much more, with AT&T's massive distribution network together. This could lead to another little ecosystem forming. And lastly, Comcast. It has ownership of NBC Universal, which means it has not only the distribution, but also the production on lock. Universal is a studio, the, the one with the big globe in the movies, maybe you've seen it. Now, the question is, how does this affect us as watchers? I think when, big emphasis, when the first shot is fired, most likely by Disney, 
and they consolidate their entire intellectual property, movies and TV under one streaming service, the name of the game will change. Everyone who distributes and streams another big player's movies and TV will realize time's running out on that game and that everything will go back to the good old days of three, four channels. Except this time, it'll be three or four streaming providers and you might have to pay for two, three, four or five to get your fixes as well. To wrap it up, I personally find it really funny how streaming was hailed, rightfully so, as the potential solution to all the divisions in the market and how everyone would just now watch stuff on Netflix or whatever the aggregator would be, because that's where everyone's production would be, in one place. The irony lies in exactly how the rise of streaming brought more consolidation and separation, and we might find ourselves with better shows, but spending more money. But hey, at least we got Orange is the New Black and Stranger Things out of it, right? As always, Hope you liked this video, drop a comment down below, click the thumbs up button, and if you really loved it, subscribe. See you next time. Ciao.